Well, hello everyone, Jerry Dearman here. Welcome back to the Solid Lives Weekly Message. You know, last week we started talking about something. In fact, we titled it this, Can I Be Saved and Sin? And we opened up some scriptures that make it so clear, but I felt like the Lord wanted us to go on and to give some more scripture and to bring some more insight because this is, I can't think of a more important question for believers. Believers who are in a world of contamination and constantly pulling us across the lines of righteousness and God's ways. And we need to know how far can I can we go? How much of the world's ways can we walk in and still walk with Jesus? Well, it's really not the best question anyway, because we should be saying, how closely can I walk with Jesus and not walk in the ways of the world? But it's important to know that the Bible does address this. So let's pray. Let's open God's word and let's get past your opinion and mine, and let's go see what God says. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us today by the Holy Spirit. Lord, answer this, in fact, settle this subject in our hearts so that we know what you believe. And Lord, not only do we know what you believe and what you expect, but Lord, we know how to do it and that you help us to do it. We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles once again to the book of Philippians. Philippians, a beautiful little book in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul right after the book of Ephesians. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2 and let's come once again to that 12th verse. Philippians 2.12 and here's what it says. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. Now, we know this is talking to believers because he says, therefore, my beloved. So we're not talking to the world, to unbelievers. We're talking to the church. We're talking to people in the body of Christ, people who are beloved of the Lord. They're saved, okay? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Well, we're keying in on this part here in verse 15, where it says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Notice again, he didn't say, uh, I want you, beloved, you believers, I want you to be saved by grace so that, you know, when you're sinning and when you're compromising, not too much, but, you know, a little bit, that you don't have to worry about it because the grace of God just covers you and you can just go on and sin. Notice that's not at all what Paul is saying. Paul is saying no. In fact, look back up at the 12th verse. He said, therefore, my beloved, as you have always what? Obeyed as you have always obeyed. And then he goes on to say, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, what? Obey, obey. Well, Paul is writing, and of course, Paul is writing this letter because he's not directly there with the church at Philippi. So he's writing a letter to remind them to stay obedient to the Lord to stay obedient to Jesus, to obedient to the word of God. And he's saying, you've always been like that. And you're like that when I'm with you. He said, but it's much more important that you're like that when I'm away. Well, you know, right now, Jesus is not here on earth with us. And so it gives us sort of the feeling that maybe we can compromise while he's not here. And then when he shows back up, then, you know, like somebody, when the boss is looking, they're working hard. And when the boss, you know, goes on an errand or whatever, they slack off. Well, the difference is that God sees everything. He's never really gone because God is omnipresent and the Lord sees everything is open to him. However, Jesus is not physically here, but the Holy Spirit is saying through the apostle Paul, much more in my absence, watch this, 
work out your own salvation, watch this, with fear and trembling. He didn't say work out your own salvation with grace and peace and just relaxation. Just just figure out what's good for you. You know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, well, the way I see it, as if that matters, as if that matters. Well, of course, it matters in terms of your decisions to behave a certain way, to allow certain things. But with regards to what's acceptable and not acceptable, what's right and wrong, what God will judge and will, what God will reward at the end of the age, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. And it doesn't matter how I feel. And this is why God gave us his word so that we could know there's, there's no surprise. I love it when an instructor, a professor in school will let you know what's going to be on the test so you know what to study, as opposed to saying, hey, something we've covered all semester is going to be on the test, but you, you don't know what it is. But if they narrow it down, well, God gave us exactly what's going to be on the test. And so we know exactly what his word says. And so notice he said, work out your own salvation. Watch this, with fear and trembling. What does that mean? That means you better not be casual about this because this is the biggest decision of your eternity. Are you going to be saved? Are you going to be in heaven with God? So he said, you better take this one more serious than which car you buy, more serious than which house you live in, more serious than which spouse you marry. This is absolutely positively, without question, the biggest decision, most consequential decision you'll, you'll ever make. You have to know in your heart how and why you are saved or not. And he said, you need to work it out with fear and trembling. Why should you be afraid? Here's why. There's deception everywhere. There's deception everywhere. There are people that will tell you, one way is okay, another way is okay. Here's the way you look at it. There's the way you look at it. I'm here to tell you, but here's the difference. I want to show you in chapter and verse in the Bible and not just one chapter and not just one verse, but I want it to be corroborated, to be verified, to be validated from many scriptures so that you can see this is absolutely without question the way that God sees it and the way that it will be judged at the end of the age. And here's why God wants you saved. God does not want you to be lost. God loves you. He wants you to be saved. And the whole way that this passage is talking, you've always been obedient, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. See, God is bringing this to us because he wants us to be saved. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And again, in verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent. Notice he didn't say that you can be covered in all the sins that you're doing. No, that you can be delivered from sinning and be, be blameless and be innocent. And what's the difference between blameless and innocent? Innocent means you didn't do anything wrong. Blameless means nobody could even blame you. You were so removed from the possibility of doing wrong. There's nobody even putting a blame on you. So blameless is even more removed from the sin than innocence. So he said that you may be blameless and innocent. Watch this. Children of God without blemish. You don't even have a mark on you. And this is what Jesus can do with folks like us, sinners like us. Oh, the Lord has forgiven me from so much. The Lord has washed me from so much, cleansed me from so much. But I'm also happy to say the Lord has shown me how to walk righteous before him. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm just saying the Lord has taught me how to walk free from sin and how to walk in righteousness. And this is what I want to bring to you as we go on in these lessons. But right now, we're going to nail this down. Can I be saved and sin? So let's look over it quickly, and we'll just read once again what Jesus said in Matthew 7. And then we're going to, we're going to go farther than we did in the last lesson. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So praying the prayer does not get the job done. 
And he goes on to say this, but one, but the one who does the will of my father who's in heaven. You can't just pray a prayer. You have to do something. Oh, Jerry, I thought we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. We are. We are. But if you're really making Jesus Lord, there will be works following. And if there are no works following, then Jesus is saying, I can see that you really didn't make me Lord. You know, you can tell somebody, you can tell the electric company, yeah, hook up the electricity in my house and I'll pay the bill every month. But if you don't pay, eventually they realize you're not paying. Yeah, but no, I, I'm going to pay. Yeah, but you're not. And so eventually they'll cut off your electricity. And this, this is not a surprise. And God is saying, uh, you'll see the salvation will not be there at the end if you don't actually follow through with the prayer you prayed to make me Lord. See, so it's not being saved by works. It's being saved by grace, but obeying because you're saved. See, it's very simple, but people confuse the matter. And so he goes on to say, on that day, talking about the end of the age, on that day, many will say to me, not just a few, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And so there are going to be folks who think, well, because I did A, B and C, then that's good, right? <laughs> See, you're making up your own rules. You're making up your own salvation. And this is why Paul said, work it out with fear and trembling, because if you customize the gospel of Jesus Christ to fit what you want, what you like, what you think, what you feel. Well, then you're going to be in trouble. We have to accept it the way it is. So he said, many are going to say, didn't I do this? And didn't I do that? And didn't I do the other? And he goes on to say, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You can't just choose which rules you're going to keep. That's not the way this works. Can you imagine signing up for maybe a university, going to school, and, and they say, okay, your classes start at a such and such a time, but you show up at a different time because that just worked for your schedule. And, and you showed up maybe with no clothes on. And people said, no, no, yeah, they, hey, they rest you. You know, you, you, you have to wear clothes. No, I just feel more comfortable. It's hot. It's summertime. I just feel more comfortable with that. You can't make up your own rules. And you can't say, well, wait, I, I paid my tuition. I, 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 I went to the library to study. No, I, I got my textbook. See, OK, maybe you did a few things, but you're not going to graduate the way you're the way you're behaving. No, you can't just pick a few things and do them and expect that now it's all going to work out. That's not the way it works in life, and that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. God lays it out there. Here's what you need to do. The good news is Jesus did the big part for us. He paid for our sins. We don't have to pay for our sins anymore. We need to receive the grace of God and salvation. But once we do, we need to walk with Jesus. And if we don't walk with Jesus and if we don't obey him, then it's showing that he's not really in charge. He's not really our Lord. Now, I want to look at something else now. Go over to Revelation 21. Oh, what a book Revelation is. But we're going to go all the way to the end. There are only 22 chapters in Revelation. But come down to Revelation 21 and look at the eighth verse. And here's what it says. And there's, this is a judgment that's going on at the end of the age. And it says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers. Now watch this. Somebody said, well, I'm not a murderer. Okay. The sexually immoral. Well, what does that mean, sexually immoral? That means that you're crossing sexual lines. You're, you're having sexual encounters and experiences that are outside of a marriage covenant. That's immorality. And that's common for our world. I mean, it's just, it's just in movies and everything, people sleeping with each other, you know, maybe just met, hooking up and such. That's common in our world. But that is absolutely not acceptable to God. That means you're not saved. And if you are saved, what do you save from? See, and so this is so clear in the Bible. I don't want anybody to miss it. God doesn't want anybody to miss it. This is not condemning. This is the Lord saying, I have salvation for you. 
But you have to be willing to walk away from your sin to accept the salvation from God. And so notice again, sexually immoral, he's giving a list. And this is not a comprehensive list. It's just a partial list. He says sorcerers. So people that are dabbling in sorcery. And I, I would even include horoscopes in that. But Ouija boards and going to palm readers and spiritists of other kind, uh, doing tarot cards and all, all of that realm, uh, the psychic hotline, all of that is where you get exposed to the spirit realm, the dark side of the spirit realm. And God says, oh, no, that's, that's not us over here on this side. That's not the kingdom of God. On this side, you've got the Holy Spirit to lead you. On the other side, you've got deceiving demonic spirits to lead you through a variety of ways. And so God says, yeah, all those people that are into that and doing that, that's not, that's not the family of God. Sorcerers, idolaters. Idol idolatry is when you're serving and worshiping something beside God. Like uh, money or sex or another person and you idolize that person or cars. It could be houses. It could be any number of things, but that takes your attention. That takes your time and you don't serve the Lord. You don't do what God wants you to do in life because, well, this has become your number one. And even a hobby could overtake you. You know, there's nothing wrong with hobbies, but it could overtake you to where you're doing the hobby, but you're not pursuing the will of God for your life. And all of these things show that Jesus is not really in charge. And you may even have the attitude, well, it's my life. See, and if you have that attitude, that is not the saved attitude. No, your life was the life of sin that Jesus died with, and it's supposed to be buried. And now the life that you live in Christ is the life that he lives through you. Do you remember Galatians 2.20, where Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so Paul is so clear that if you're still living your life, then, then you're not walking with the Lord. You're not saved. Your life was the life that needed to die with Jesus on the cross. And so if your life died with Jesus on the cross, then he's given you a new life. And now he gets to live through you. Let me tell you, this is the best life in the world to let Jesus live through you. Don't think you're missing out. You're not missing out. You're going to miss out on heartache and bondage and sin and perversity and eventually a horrible life in eternity. The best life in the world is to let Jesus wash you and cleanse you and then live inside of you and live your life to do what he wants you to do. That's the best life in the world. This is called salvation. And it's our calling. So let me finish this because this is so important. But, the, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immortal sorcerers, idolaters, watch this, and all liars. Oh, there are a lot of liars today. A lot of liars, even the body of Christ. Just so quick to lie. Just so quick to lie just to cover their own rear ends, just deflect, lie, just quick, lie, 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 lie. So many people that allow lying in their lives. God is a God of truth. The Bible says in Titus 1 verse 2, he cannot lie. And so if you are his child and you're walking with him, you don't walk like that. You don't lie. And when you do, you fess up and you get it straight because it was wrong. See, so, and all liars. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. Well, let's see what happens to all these kinds of people. And all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Folks, that's called the lake of fire. That's not heaven. That's the opposite of heaven. That's the other direction. And this is so clear in the Bible. Now, somebody, somebody said, well, well, so it is works. We're saved by works. Uh-uh. You cannot be saved by being obedient enough. There's no chance. Zero. You have to just receive the grace of Jesus, the payment that he made for us on the cross, and accept that by faith. But once you're saved, now 
You need to be saved. You need to walk in salvation. Let me give you this example. When a person gets married, well, you, you can't buy your spouse. Well, at least not in our nation, you can't. You can't buy your spouse. And so you get married, and it's the love that that spouse is affording to you, saying, yes, I want to commit to you to be in this marriage covenant for the rest of our lives. Well, that's great. But once you say, I do, and you make those vows, well, there's an expectation that now you're going to act as if you're married. And if you don't act as if you're married, and you're going around and flirting, and you know, looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend, well, that you're going to get called on the carpet. Why? Because it's inappropriate. And you may say, what? I, I said I do. What, what's the problem? The problem is what you said I do to requires a thereafter behavior, a thereafter commitment. See, this is, this is no mystery. This is no game. It's so simple. But in our world, Christians, and I hate to say it, but even sometimes Bible teachers have condoned this under a grace theology that have taught us something that's not true. And let me tell you, you may think, well, I'm just going to keep listening to those grace preachers. That's fine. But I'm telling you, you risk going to hell by buying into that because it's not my teaching, their teaching. No. But what does the Bible say? And how can you get around these passages? Here's the good news. The reason why the Lord tells us these things is not to condemn us, but to save us so that we would know. Wouldn't you want to know if you're driving your car 60 miles an hour down a road and you're about to go to a bridge, but the bridge fell, fell apart and your, your car is just going to go right into the cavern? Of course you'd want to know. You want blockades. You want signage. You want some warnings. And this is the goodness of God to let us know you can't accept that compromising doctrine that Christians can live a lifestyle of sin and go to heaven. It's not possible. It's unacceptable. It will not be accepted by the Lord. The good news is this. Jesus said, if you'll repent, if you'll stay with me, if you'll confess your sins, I have already paid for your sins. I don't have to pay for them again once you repent. I've already paid for your sins. And my innocent blood that paid for your sins will wash you as white as snow. And not only that, but I will put my spirit in you and I'll strengthen you from the inside out. And this is part of what we're going to talk about as we go on in these lessons. How to be strong, how to break free from sin, how to walk free from sin, how to stay free, to walk on the path of righteousness. All of this is in the Bible. See, right now I'm just establishing that we need to do it. That if you're a believer and you want to be, be a believer and you want to be saved, that you must embrace that we are to be obedient and to not live lifestyles of sin. See, I'm establishing that in these first two lessons. But we're going to go on to talk about how we break free from those bondages of sin and begin to live that life with the Lord and how he strengthens us to do it. And let me tell you, this is real. This is for anybody. I don't care how long you've been sinning. I don't care how bad the sins were. I don't care how much rebellion you've been in, a, a lot or a little. The Lord wants to do this in your life. He loves you. And it's the best life you could ever live, a life free from sin and free from guilt, being the person God created you to be, fulfilling the assignment that he's given you all by grace, all by grace. But we must choose it. So as we close this out, let's pray and let's let the Lord know, Lord, I, I will not accept any belief system, doctrine, theory that says that as a believer, it's OK if I condone a life of sin or have compromises in my life. Now, no, that's not OK. Somebody said, doesn't everybody sin? Everybody does sin, but everybody doesn't allow that to continue. See, you confront it, you confess it and you repent of it and you let the Lord take you from that. See, so so let's pray right now. And then I want to invite you to stay with me 
in this whole series of messages so that you can break free from sin and begin to live the life that God wants you to live and that you really want to live as a born again person. So come on, let's come before the Lord. Father, I pray in Jesus name that you would minister to this person that I'm talking to right now. While I'm talking, Lord, you're talking to them. You're touching their heart by your word. The entrance of your words gives light. Lord, you're bringing light to this person. Their understanding, it's becoming clear what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And now, Lord, as they're accepting your word and your truth, Lord, I thank you that you strengthen them by your spirit. Uh, Lord, if they're not saved, save them. May they be born from above. May a transformation take place in their heart by the Holy Spirit. In fact, all of you, would you pray? Would, my prayers are important. My prayers are beneficial for you, but your prayers are by far more beneficial and more impactful for your life than mine because you have authority over your life. So pray right now. Say, Lord, save me. If you need to be saved, if you need to repent, say, Lord, I repent. Forgive my sins. Lord, I don't condone this and I don't condone that. And I not only ask you to cleanse me, but Lord, I ask you to strengthen me to not do that anymore, to not walk in that anymore, to make the decisions necessary to walk in freedom, to walk in purity, to be blameless and innocent and even without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. And let me just say, I'm glad you joined us today. The Lord loves you. He's helping you. He's not against you. He's for you. Somebody said, well, if he's for me, why doesn't he tell me things that are good? He's telling you things that are so good. He's telling you what to expect and how to be prepared for it and how to walk with him every day. The Lord wants to walk with you and bless you and minister to you and encourage you every single day. And this is one way that he does it by teaching you from his precious word. So next week, be back here with us. We're going to take this a few more steps farther. Have a Bible with you if you can. Begin to mark your Bible if you haven't already begun to do that so that you can be learning the principles of the Lord and so that you can teach others the ways of God as well. Let me also encourage you, share the link of this message with somebody that you know that may be interested. Let them know about the previous message that goes along with this and invite them to begin to join with us week by week as we walk in the truth of the word of God and we let God teach us his ways. He's a good God and he loves you very much. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining our Solid Lives weekly message. We are grateful to our partners who help us continue to provide resources like these messages, online discipleship, and so much more, all free of charge. If you're interested in becoming a Solid Lives partner, just set up a recurring gift when you click give at solidlives.com or on the Solid Lives app. Now, I wanna tell you that if you feel called to ministry in any way, our BFAM Training Center was developed just for that, to empower and equip you for spirit-filled, fruitful ministry. Right now, we're accepting new enrollments and registrations for the fall semester. You can find out all the details at solidlives.com or on our app. And don't forget about our big annual BFAM conference being held October 7th through 9th in Anaheim, California. The conference is completely free. You can find out more details at solidlives.com or on the Solid Lives app. Join us next week as Jerry launches a brand new series called Breaking Free from Sin. You won't want to miss that. And I want to say to all of you that if you feel like the Lord wants you to minister, maybe right there in your neighborhood, maybe right there in your home, to the community, to your neighbors around you, then I want to invite you to partner with us to plant a house church. I just moved with my wife to a brand new neighborhood and I'm telling you, God is stirring my heart and I'm praying, Lord, help me to make many disciples in this neighborhood and Lord, help me to plant many churches in this neighborhood. Now, of course, we have campuses that are part of the church that I pastor, but oh, I know in my heart that with the season we're in and with the season that's coming, 
God wants to plant house churches everywhere. If you feel called, if you would pray and you feel a tug on your heart, that God wants you to at least look into it and be trained. I'd love for you to go and fill out an interest form, either at solidlives.com, clicking on house churches, or the Solid Lives app. Fill out an interest form and allow us to partner with you, allow us to train you, allow us to show you the many tools and resources that we have to help house church leaders and if you want to cover and you can be part of our ministry, Solid Lives, and we'll connect on a regular basis. We'll continue to train you, pray for you, and partner with you to see God do a mighty work right there in your neighborhood. I'd love to have you partner with us here at Solid Lives. Go to solidlives.com or the Solid Lives app.